25, 25 summers. Subscribe to the page, like the content. Um, let's talk about some not so famous, uh, memorable people that you had mentioned to me. We could start with a um, brother by the name of Gizmo. Yeah, Gizmo. Yeah, that was my man, man, a brother, man, that I met in 1987, man, when I first went upstate. He, um, you know, he was a good dude, man. He was a, he was a good brother, man. He was into boxing. I find out later that he was the champ of the state, but I didn't get the chance to meet him when we first encountered, man, because I had got key blocked for a fight that I had. But he witnessed a situation going down with me, and he was thinking, like, maybe the brother might need help. Little to his note that I didn't need no help with that. But I ended up meeting him 10 days later. And after the 10 days later, we got cool. We started working out together, you know, letting me know about his family. He got his family, you know, so on and so on. He only had like about seven, eight more years to do. But he was the champ of the state, man, for like five or six years. We worked out together and everything, right? So, you know, he, he, he goes home. Like maybe he goes home in 1997, 98. He gets to the street, man, and everything, man. He has a, a wife, and together they make this daughter. And through I learned to know now, she's like about 30 years old. She never got a chance to meet her pops because he was killed in the neighborhood that I'm out there by in Staten Island now, you know. And I'm seeing that his daughter is going through a lot of things right now, man, with these knucklehead dudes out here, man, taking advantage of his daughter. And... He's, he's dead, you know. Now, I don't know if he was alive, man. He wouldn't have went for none of this stuff that his daughter's going through with these guys, man. You know, dragging her name all through the internet, man. Disrespecting her as a woman, man. And she got a baby by this cat here. But um, he, 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 he was a good dude, man. But he had, a heart of, he had a heart of gold, man. But he had zero tolerance for nonsense. And when he went, to the, went to around the neighborhood, man, a few younger dudes was intimidated by him, man. Started up some nonsense with him. He ended up getting in a shootout, man. He was killed right on the block that I live now, man. So I just, you know, think about him a lot, man, because a lot of the things that I was taught, a lot of the, my, my prison savvy I got came from him, man, being with this dude, man. I knew him for a few years, man. And we we kind of like stuck it out together, man. And I knew his downfalls and his ups and downs, man. But, um, he needed to be alive, man, this man, because his daughter really needs him, man. She's going through a hell of a time with one of these idiots out here in the street, you know, that, you know, taking advantage of her and so forth, man. You know, it's a good brother, man. A lot of brothers from the penitentiary know who Big Gears was, man. They know that he'd be well missed, man. How much time did he do before he got out uh, and was killed? He, his, 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 his sentence was uh, 12 and a half to 25. And where was you upstate with him at? In Elmira in 87. I was with him the whole time in 87 till he had left. He had went on a draft. I believe he went to uh, Sharonga, and he left like about five years from there. So, And number three years from there, he went to the board, and then he was released. He made his first board. When he went home, man, he stayed out in the street for about six or seven years, man. And then he left Brooklyn because, you know, he's from Brooklyn. He wasn't from Staten Island. But when he moved out to Staten Island with his with his with his baby moms, the the the, the lady that had the baby, the, the daughter that I'm telling you about, he moved and relocated to Staten Island, man. That's where he succumbed to his death out there with them young dudes, you know, in, in my neighborhood. A beef that started somewhere in Park Hill and then he ended up getting killed, like right in West Brighton. So yeah, man, I miss him, man. That was a good brother. Taught me most of the things that I knew. About how to bid, how to be, how to carry yourself in the penitentiary, man. So yeah, that was one of the, one one of my good friends, man. That I could say I had a good friend, and he was in the penitentiary. Okay, let's speak about another person you mentioned to me by the name of Dice. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, Dice. It's, it's funny you mentioned Dice because I was just I was just talking to uh, a cousin of his, man. To, anyway, he's still locked up. Anyway. This brother Dice, right, that I met, man, was one of the most notorious dudes that was from from the Bronx, man. I mean, he had a he had a rap sheet that was crazy with robberies and stuff. But when he came into Rikers Island, he just flipped on some animal stuff, man. He's cutting everybody, he will stab everybody. He, you know, he had a problem with police. He's the reason why they started the Predator Cutters. You know, don't listen to these other stories. These other cats is telling you this dude Dice, man, Beasley. Everybody knows him. Now, when we all leave to go upstate, 
uh, he left to go upstate after us. I end up seeing him in Comstock like about three years later. Now he's not Dice no more. His name is Little Kim. He calls himself Little Kim, right? Completely a mook, all the way out the closet with the pink shirt on, with the pink everything, the lipstick on and everything. Completely acting, you know, it was a mook. But um, I was trying to explain to a few dudes that I knew that was trying to ostracize him, man, you know, is for being a mook. I told him, man, you, you shouldn't judge this brother by the cover because it might be something going on in his brain that's got him feeling or thinking that this is what he is. But deep down, he's never going to be that. Now, let these dudes know twice that this was a gangster dude, man. Don't get fooled by the fact that now he wants to be, you know, a woman or something you know, so on. And they did it. They ostracized him. They pressed him. They tried to press up on him and they stored him for a certain thing. And I was like, yeah, I know it's coming. And little did we know, man, the same afternoon, man, this dude Dice I'm telling you about, they changed his name to Little Kim because I guess his sexuality is compromised and now he's being, you know, one of these moves. Yeah, he ripped this dude's face halfway off, man, you know, and they were shocked and thought like, well, how can a mook do that? I tried to explain to them that because something's going on in his brain to make him think that he's a woman, it has absolutely nothing to do with his heart and his ability to be a man in the penitentiary. And that he was, and for that, the guys learned a hell of a lesson behind that, man. To this day, he's still locked up now, man. He's still out of the closet, man. He's still calling himself Little Kim and everything. But I, but under no circumstances are you to take this guy like he's some soft guy or something like that just because now he walks with a switch and a sway and, you know, he's, you know, he's on some mook stuff. But he's one of the most dangerous dudes I've ever seen, not just only as a real dude, but as the illusion dude that he thought he was, you know, and, 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 and like I say, that was one of my friends and I never ostracized him, man. When I seen him in Comstock, I still was kicking it to him. I still saying what's up to him. I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing no, no little Kim stuff calling you, man. You dice. He's like, yo, you call me dice, man. Whatever, man. I was like, yeah, but we were still kicking it. And people was wondering why was I still talking to him? Because people, man, he's a person. He's a person, man. And, and and he has integrity just like everybody else, man. And one thing I know for a fact, he didn't stand for no bull crap, whether he was Dice, whether he was Little Kim or not. And they learned the hard way, man. And this is what I'm telling you, by way of the Bloods. The Bloods figure they're going to take advantage of him. They're going to store him, take something from him. I explained to them dudes, man, that this is not the type of dude that you need to be. Yo, well, he's Red Dragon, you know, Mook, you know, and all of that. Where, you know, he can't be living here and all of that. And I'm like, well, who makes you say someone can't live? Well, if you're man enough to do that, man, go on and step to him, man, and see what happens. And they did, and that's what happened. He ripped one of their face off. I think he gave one guy 140-something stitches, man, in his face in one motion. You know, so they couldn't believe it went down, and it went down like that, man. But Dice, to this day, still my boy, man. It don't matter, man, what, what, what his mindset telling me is, man. And he's still locked up doing time in New York State Prison. What What was the incident that brought him to cut somebody that finally pushed him over the ledge? You said they were pressing him, they were doing okay, other things. Yeah, what was you, the specific incident? This is what they do. This is what the bloods do. When they come and they see somebody and they feel that that person is vulnerable or they feel they got one up on them because there's many of them and so few of you. In this, in this situation, they felt a new person came through. He was a mook. He dressing in pink. Uh, he must have a little money. They might want to store him for commissary. They might want to store him for his package. They might want to press him to see if he got visits, if he going down getting the bag or whatever, and they figure like, yeah, they're going to make him, you know, they subject, and that was the wrong thing to do, you know, and like he told them twice, he told them twice, he was like, I'm not who you think I am, so try that with somebody else and all of that, you know how they do the friendly extortion, they roll on you and they tell you, yo, I got a hundred dudes in here, man, we all blood, once I move, they all move, so to the average dude, that instills some type of fear in them. And in turn, that'll make you surrender your goods or give up whatever it is they're trying to press you for. But he was in for a rude awakening, man, because 
he's the one that got his face ripped off after somebody else already gassed him up to go press the move, you know. And that, I know for a fact, I was there in Comstock when that went down. Okay, um, you mentioned that you were involved in some knife fights. Um, care to tell us about it? Yeah, I had a, I had a, a problem with the Cubans, you know, and there was a couple of Cuban brothers, man. And like I said, they stick together. There's very few of them, too. But I had a few problems with them. And not like the other Hispanic dudes, these dudes are real serious dudes when it comes to that knife thing, you know. And I got into an altercation with one. One owed me a little bit of money. So he didn't pay me no money, so I handled it. And I took care of him and all of that. But they so connected in the penitentiary is that you can leave here and go to another place, to another jail, and they'll send word over to that jail. And because they're Cubans and it's only few of them calling Castro guys, you know, they'll get you, man, you know. And I didn't see it coming, man, in Shawanga, man. And I got hit twice by one of them dudes, man. I got hit kind of bad by them, you know. So... I took my medicine, I took my licks, man, it went on, man, the police, what happened, I don't know, you know, I don't know who it was, whatever the case was, they got me out of there, I went to involuntary protective custody, they got me up to the next jail, I get to the next jail, and um, I see one of them, the other ones of them, so, you know, by that time, man, I don't nurse myself good, I'm back good, I'm healthy, back to working out and everything, tore this dude up, man, on, on lower level five, man, just because it was him and the other dudes and they roll together. So what's good for one is good for all. That's the way you're going to have to think in there because when they catch you on any type of neutral ground, believe me, you're going to have a knife fight with one of them, man. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get toe up messing with them. So in my case, it's better to leap than to ask questions there, man. So I took my medicine like a man. They had to take their medicine like a man, you know. And yeah, and I had got hit with Shawonga behind that, messing with those guys, man, you know, because they dangerous, they ruthless, they come from the jungle in Cuba, Castro kicked them all out and sent them over here to America in 82, and they came straight here and went right to the penitentiary system, man, so they've been living that way ever since. So where did you get stabbed at? Or cut at all. I got whatever. stabbed in my back and I got stabbed in, in 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 my back twice and I got hit in my like my shoulder like twice. So when you mentioned about the Cubans sending word because they're tight knit, is that just them or is that all gangs and cliques and groups? Yeah. Do they all do that? If you have a problem on one facility, the word goes to the other? Yeah, so yeah, they do that. They will they'll send the information by way of through their family and send a third party kite out to the street, a letter gets out to the street and in turn it'll come back to you and now you're in another jail and you get the info and this is me, you get the picture on me, you get the beat on me and then it'll usually be you or somebody else that's part of the same knit organization will usually step to the subject man and handle their business for them man. So a lot of that's being passed on man, you know, beefs are going from prison to prison to prison to prison, man. And they don't ever really run out, man, until, you know, they either wave the white flag, they're tired of you wreaking havoc on them, or you just bow out, man, and go to PC and play PC for the rest of your bed, you know? Yeah, so you said when you got stabbed, you went to involuntary PC, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Why is that? Because I wouldn't name the assailant. I wouldn't cooperate with the officials because they was trying to figure out that they gave me medical attention, but in the same breath, they wanted to know who did that. And, and I didn't know, and I didn't give them the information who did it. So now they had to place me in somewhere until they can get me out because they felt like that my life was in danger. And if you don't know who the assailant is or who did it to you, or you don't cooperate and give up information on them, then they'll put you in what you call involuntary protective custody until you can be transferred out because it deems the safety and security and the detrimental in the facility as well as the facility as well as yourself. So when you say transferred out, you mean transferred out where? The unit or the prison? Out of the prison completely. Once you get stabbed or something like that and you don't identify the person that did it to you, you're being put on the draft or transferred to leave the facility completely. So where were you transferred to? I was sent right from, from that prison to, I was sent to Auburn. It's so an Auburn Correctional Facility from there. So, you know, when I got out in Auburn, 
you know, then I go right into general population. You're no longer in involuntary no more. Involuntary is just because they involuntarily protected you in the prison that you was in because you claim to not know who the person that did it to you. So you got shipped out of Shawanga when you right. got stabbed and went to Auburn. Right. So you was in Auburn more than once. Correct? Yeah, I've been to Auburn like three times, yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned something about a stabbing with two people in Elmira. Care to um, elaborate on that? A stabbing with two people in Elmira? Yes. With me? Yes. Yeah, I've been in a bunch of stabbings in Elmira, man. And yes, it's just a couple of people at different times, man. Yeah, I had a problem with the Latin Kings at, in, in Elmira as well. And um, yeah, I had stabbed a couple of people in Elmira, man. Two, maybe three on different occasions. Like I said, I've been to Elmira five times. But this one particular time you're talking about, yeah, I had got into a knife fight, but I got the jump, man. Before they knew anything to hit him, man, I already stabbed both of them. So were you sent to lock up or whatever for that, or were you shipped out for that? But yeah, I, yeah, I was sent to SHU for that incident. Yeah, yeah. How long did you stay in SHU for that? Like about maybe four months to the conclusion of the hearing, and after the conclusion of the hearing, they at least give you sixty days to appeal it. And when you appeal it to Albany, which is special housing unit in Albany, the director, you usually get your answer back within forty-five days. From that point on, the administration know whether you're going to be in the facility or you're going to be put on a transfer to get out of the facility, you know. So I was transferred out of the facility. 